this is a dramatic development but is it actually going to go through what are all the catches in this but who better to throw that question to than the man who's really spearheading all of this uh, the person who's been pushing this through the chairperson of the UGC professor Jagdesh Kumar sir it's a pleasure and a privilege to be talking to you at the time you've been able to push this thing through and I have to tell you for decades people are saying this is exactly what India should consider doing with higher education although there are caveats or some questions that I'm about to throw at you First of all, how confident are you? How confident are you that the big universities in the world will come and set up base right here in India? Vikram, what has happened during the last two years is the introduction of the national education policy in India and its implementation. The entire ecosystem surrounding this higher education in India is being transformed. And there is a very, very positive atmosphere in India for the foreign institutions to come and establish their campuses here. And that's the reason why UGC recently has introduced a regulation which facilitates the easy entry of foreign campuses in India. And we are all excited about the prospect of uh, working together with uh, international faculty and international institutions uh, in India. So I'm just trying to understand the model. Any foreign, big foreign university can come here, they can set up a campus, they can charge whatever fees they like, they can teach whatever they like, hire whichever faculty they like, and essentially it's like an extension of their parent cam campus. It's like, uh, you know, what's happening in Abu Dhabi or Yale and US. Is that really the model that India is now coming forward with? The national education policy very clearly mentions that the foreign institutions which set up their campuses here should be given the same autonomy that is available uh, to the other universities in India. And that's the reason why we have decided that uh, whether it is the admission policy or faculty recruitment, staff recruitment policy or the tuition fee structure, it will be left entirely to the foreign higher educational institution to decide. So, and we are also saying that the quality of education that is imported in these campuses, therefore, should be on par with what is uh, given at the main campus. So, sir, if you could just look at some of the issues potentially around this. Let's, for example, look at salary structure and fee structure. And in India, I think the most expensive private university would be, what, about 10, 10 lakh rupees or so a year. In a typical U.S. university, that could be 75 or $80,000 a year. So there's a big gap out there. Similarly, when it comes to salary, I mean, you know what Indian professors get. Uh, a really good professor in an American university could get $130,000, $150,000 a year. So... What I know you've said that it's their freedom, they can do what they want, but there is a big gap. Where do you expect the final numbers to settle? Uh, you see, even in Indian universities, the University Grants Commission doesn't regulate the tuition fee structure. It is the statutory bodies such as the Academic Council and Executive Council, they decide the tuition fee structure. So we would like to leave this aspect uh, to the campuses of the foreign higher educational institutions to decide. However, as you said, uh, there could be some students who may not be financially sound uh, to join in these campuses. That is why in the regulations we have uh, mentioned that these foreign institutions can give, based on an evaluation process, um, need-based partial or full scholarships. And this is a global practice. Therefore, on one side, you may have students who have the financial means to join in these campuses. And on the other side, we also want to meet the requirements of those students who are not financially sound um, by introducing this class of the partial and full scholarships. Now, from the Indian point of view, of course, there are 400,000 Indian students, give or take. Actually, it was 650 or thereabouts last year, 650,000. A lot of students are going abroad, a lot of foreign exchange also going into that, which... I guess part of what you're trying to do is make sure that that foreign exchange stays right here in India. And the second aspect is that these, that with colleges even in India being so competitive, it's not easy for Indian students to get into colleges here. Now, more supply opens up. They have more options. You're right. Currently, in 2022 itself, about 450,000 students went abroad for higher studies. And uh, one survey says that this number may increase next year to about 1.8 million students. 
So there are a large number of students who are willing to go abroad for high quality, higher education. Uh, it's not that we are going to reverse this trend. We are only providing an additional option to the students. Those students, many students who go abroad may be going for various reasons, not just only for uh, a, a degree from a foreign university, but also for the experience of working in a different society, in a different cultural setup. Uh, so those students will continue to go. But however, we are also mindful of the fact that there could be a large number of other set of students who do not have the financial means to go abroad, or they may like to stay in India, but have access to foreign universities. So it is for those students that we are providing an additional option of staying in India, but have access to high quality uh, education from a foreign university. Okay. <laughs> Professor Jagdesh Kumar, the positives are clear in this entire debate, but now let's look at some of the possible questions that the foreign universities are, are probably going to have. Now, for example, in the draft rules, you've got clauses which are saying, uh, you know, you can't teach anything against Indian national interests, which is, I guess, clear enough, but not against public order, relationships with friendly countries. Now, a lot of these are phrases that are there in the Constitution. It's restriction on the freedom of speech. It's sort of, you could say it is a boiler, uh, you know, boilerplate. This is, this is a temporary which is often there in many of these drafts. But for a foreign university, it might get them scratching their head and saying, hmm, what does this mean? What if you're teaching history? What if you're teaching some form of sociology? Could somebody object? Could somebody come and file an FIR and saying, why are you, uh, you know, teaching this? This could be against relations with, with China or some other country. So is this something that could deter many foreign universities? Say, we don't want to do this. In our own educational institutions, we promote the freedom of expression. Uh, I myself uh, ask my students to challenge me uh, in my class uh, about what I am teaching. So freedom of expression, critical thinking are part of our Indian educational system. And the class that you are referring to about uh, uh, the academic programs and activities of these campuses should be in tune with the national security uh, uh, of our country. These are general classes, um, and you will find such classes in any international uh, agreements between countries, for example. So therefore, not much uh, should be read into these classes. These are general uh, preventive measures kind of classes. It doesn't mean that UGC is going to check every program, uh, every lecture to see whether it is uh, uh, in tune with the national interest of the country. All right, sir, last question. Uh, have you already got any expressions of interest? Uh, any foreign universities come to you and said, yeah, we want to do this. And also, how soon do you think it will be before these universities will actually be here and start setting up their campuses right here in India? You know, recently there was a uh, survey by an institution called the National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration in India. And they found that... Uh, uh, the global top 200 uh, universities, they have expressed their interest in considering India as an ideal destination. And we are also in discussion with the uh, various universities, the foreign delegations which come to UGC, we explain to them about the possibility of establishing campuses here. Um, they have shown very keen interest. And uh, already few European countries are in uh, uh, dialogue with us. Uh, they are, in fact, waiting for the regulations to be announced so that the campuses can be set up. And we are very, very hopeful that in the next uh, uh, two years, three years, uh, there will be many top global universities uh, which will uh, establish their campuses here. And UGC will work very proactively in hand-holding them and in providing all the information that they require to establish their campus in India. Okay, Professor Jagdish Kumar, chairperson of the UGC, the person behind or pushing a lot of, the, a lot of the, these new uh, rules and systems. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing that perspective with us. Okay, so it's a great idea, but what's the response going to be? What's the response going to be from children out here and their parents? Are they going to start eyeing these uh, foreign campuses or campuses of foreign universities if they are, in fact, set up here? Who better to ask than Anjali Rakhbir, one of India's top educational consultants. She sent more kids abroad to the Ivy Leagues than uh, anybody else whom I know. So, Anjali, great to have you, have you with us. Now, 
You help so many children, right? You are wanting to go to America or Canada or the UK or Australia. They're all there and you're helping them. You're holding their hands. You're taking them through that very competitive process. Now, when you hearing about these, these new systems, if those same universities were to set up campuses in India, does that change things? Would people be wanting to go to one of those universities and their campuses right here in India? Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, students would embrace that opportunity for sure. Um, and you look at even campuses such as Ashoka, uh, you know, that, that have come up, uh, people have really embraced that. Um, they follow a very um, international way of doing their curriculum. And it is literally at a tenth of the cost uh, of what US universities or UK universities charge. So I think the cost differential is going to be huge and people are really, really going to embrace this. Okay, but, but that is assuming that there is a cost differential, right? Because the foreign universities have been allowed to price at whatever they want. So if an American university charges, uh, you know, comes to India and says, okay, we're also going to do it at $70,000 uh, in India as we do abroad. Now, they may be skeptical. They may think it's a bad idea because students may not do it, but they are allowed to do it. They will probably reduce it a bit, but we're not quite sure what they will reduce it to. And will it come down to the Ashoka level or Indian University levels? Right. I, I'm not sure, so sure if they get it at the same price, uh, then mm. it's going to become just sort of, you know, uh, the campus being located in India. Just as you see NYU and Abu Dhabi, I think the fee is about 55,000 US dollars as compared with the New York one, which is New York NYU is about, I think, $75,000. Um, so there's a little bit of a differential, about 25%. But um, to, to say that people would embrace it, you know, at the same price, I'm not so sure. Because today, a US education in Indian rupees is costing around 2.2 crores. And if they were to subsidize a little bit, and if they came in at one and a half, two crores, say, um, it would still be pretty high uh, because, you know, people do earn in dollars once they um, finish their education and they're able to pay back the loans or, you know, at least what the parents have paid. They're able to uh, sort of at least get back some of that. So I think costing is going to play a pretty major role. Pricing is going to be quite a key point. OK, so you're saying they cannot price it too high because then the demand could actually go down sharply. And that's particularly important because many of those kids are then eyeing jobs abroad uh, or saying we want that experience abroad. So if you're going to be staying on in India, you can't price it at the same level. That's coming across very, very clear to you. Now, out of curiosity, in your experience, you've helped so many kids. Are a lot of people going abroad because they want to emigrate and they want that foreign experience? Or are they also doing it because it's very difficult to get into a good university here in India. There are not that many of them, and it's tough to get inside them with those 99% cutoffs. What, what is it? What, what actually drives most kids here? No, 100%. My experience has been that students are studying there because they want to emigrate. And that is why Canada is becoming more popular, because the U.S. visa rules are very tricky now. Uh, you get a three-year optional practical training visa for a STEM course. But for another course, you would get only one year's optional practical training, which leaves you sort of, you know, in, in, still in the dark. And then they, they're not assured of their H-1B visas and things like that. So Canada's popularity indicates to me that definitely people are wanting to settle down there, get a PR, earn in dollar terms, uh, you know, maximize the biggest bang for their buck, basically. Okay, so then I guess foreign universities will also be scratching their heads a little bit. You're saying that they can't price it too high but, and there will be some variance among students because if you're going to one of these universities out here, uh, you're not necessarily getting that immigration question sorted out. Um, so you've got to figure out what is actually going to then drive the popularity of these campuses. What to your mind will do it? I think uh, if you look at NYU Abu Dhabi, I would look at that at that as a model, say, I would say that they've become um, sort of, you know, a really a great hub to give an international education, not necessarily at the price point, but it's focused like an international education. It could be just a campus anywhere in the world for them. So it's just about the kind of faculty, the kind of courses, the kind of education you would get. And then probably students may use that as a stepping stone for masters. But they also offer good scholarships. 
So maybe some of that could be offset by scholarships, I think. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not so sure what would really drive the demand. I think it's just a lack of education institutions or that level in India. Uh, it's just so competitive to get into schools today over here, uh, the kind of cutoffs that come. Uh, and I'm sure even these would be very high in demand and they would have a very high criteria of, of selection. So what's your final verdict then, Anjali? Good move for India, good move for students, good move for the universities. How do you think it's going to pan out? Absolutely. There's some 40 million students out there. You know, so for them, this is just a drop in the ocean. How many universities will open up here? So, so it could become a great education hub, I think. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. All right, Anjali, thank you so much for that. So a potentially big move, something that could change the landscape of the Indian higher education sector forever. Now, we've heard from the chairperson of the UGC and we've heard from education experts. But what do you think? Is this something that you would like to consider? If you're a student, would you like to go to the Indian campus of a big foreign university? If you're a parent, you're presumably really delighted by this because fees could be lower and your kids stay right here in India. They don't have to go abroad. But whatever it is, send us your feedback. Let us know what you think about this uh, particular move. Here are the various handles on which you can send us your feedback. And that's all we have for you this week on the India Story. But do join us every week as we track the latest developments from India for the global citizen. Bye for now.